Today is June 27th, 2011. We're at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the History Center, and with me is Tony Hilliard, who is also a volunteer. And we're honored also to have with us today Mark Walker. Uh, Mr. Walker has agreed to come in and tell us the story of his life, and particularly the time that he spent in the military and the time he spent in the military during the Vietnam era. Uh, this is in connection with the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. And Mr. Walker, we really appreciate you coming in today. My pleasure. Could you give us your full name and current address? Full name is John Mark Walker, Jr. And where and when were you born? Memphis, Tennessee, November 19, 1941. Okay. Tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, I spent the first 12 years of my life in Memphis, um, except for a little period during World War II when my father was uh, working for the DuPont Corporation as a chemist. He didn't know it at the time, and probably didn't know it for another 20 years, but he was working on the atom bomb. doing. He told me later he was doing tests on smokeless powders. And we lived in Richland, Washington, and I have vague memories of that. I remember once uh, walking down the street with Dad and in my memory, I'm holding his hand, and this kid comes by in one of these little pedal cars that's shaped like a tank. And I said, Dad, I want one of those. And he said, well, son, maybe after the war. Huh. And uh, you couldn't buy those things anymore yeah. because they used metal. So uh, apparently we had rationing even uh, working for DuPont out there yeah. in, in Washington State. Uh, we. Moved from there after the war, briefly lived in Indiana, and then came back to Memphis where we spent uh, the next, uh, I guess, 11 years or so. And uh, my dad was working in the pharmaceutical business, so he got promoted from time to time. And every time he did, we moved halfway across the country. But I remember they uh, started school in Memphis at Treadwell School, which 10 years ago was still there. And uh, we moved out to Raleigh. Tennessee when I was in the middle of the seventh grade, which was one of the big adventures of my life, spent a year and a half there. Then we moved to Raleigh, North Carolina, which was a wonderful place to live. And in the middle of my uh, junior year, Dad got promoted and then went to Minnesota. So I spent my senior year in the frozen wastelands of <laughs> Minneapolis and wound up going to the University of Minnesota uh, because I could get in-state tuition. <laughs> <laughs> Good reason. So that's uh, my background. Did you have relatives who served in the military? Well, my uh, maternal grandfather served in World War I in the unglamorous role of a cook. And I don't, rem I don't know where he actually served. He was overseas somewhere. Um, I had an uncle on my father's side that was in the Army. He was drafted. I don't know where he served. Uh, that information has been lost. And another uncle on my mother's side that I can remember when he went in the Navy. And I guess uh, that's one of the reasons I maybe joined the Navy was because my Uncle David, who was my favorite uncle, was in the Navy. Yeah. And I remember that white uniform and him throwing his sea bag over his shoulder and walking out the door, my grandmother just dissolving in a puddle of tears. Because she just knew she would never see him again. Of course, the war ended six months later and he was halfway to Okinawa or something on a ship. And they turned around and came back. <laughs> so he got out. Now, when you joined the military, were you drafted or did you enlist? Well, when I was a junior in high school, uh, I mean in college, I could kind of see the handwriting on the wall. The Vietnam thing was starting to heat up. And I still didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, so I sort of thought I'd like to have the option of going in uh, the military. And uh, I talked to different people about it, and a lot of my friends were in ROTC. And the guys with the best looking uniforms, of course, were the Navy guys. And uh, so that summer, between my, soft, my junior and senior year, uh, I was at home. My parents at that time were living in the D.C. area, so I went down to the uh, Navy recruiting station in Washington, D.C. and took the test to go to officer candidate school okay. and uh, was accepted for the supply corps because I had terrible eyesight. And uh, so uh, I joined as a volunteer, but the real impetus was on my 21st birthday, right in the first quarter of my senior year, I got this little notice in the mail in the shape of a 1A classification for draft. And I knew that the moment I graduated, I would be pulled into the Army. So I said, I'm going to take control of this. 
and uh, in February went down and got sworn in as an officer candidate seaman apprentice. Okay. And in July I went to officer candidate school. And what year was this? 63. Okay. And when did you actually join the military? After well, actually, active duty. Active duty would have started counting on the 22nd of July, I believe it was, in 1963. Okay. And uh, that's when they gave us a voucher for a plane ticket from Minneapolis to Newport, Rhode Island. Okay. And uh, I met a guy at the Navy Y. We all stayed at the Y there because it was three bucks. Because <laughs> nobody had any money. Yeah. And uh, I uh, went around the corner to mail some postcards or something. I came back and the bus had left to go to the base. And so I'm kind of standing there, I guess, looking lost. And this guy in this, this mid, I guess you could say a Kansas accent said, are you going out to officer candidate school? And I said, yeah. He said, well, you can ride with me. And this guy's name was Norman Schwarzkopf. Now, he was not the general. He spelled his last name differently, but he was a wonderful friend for about uh, a year and a half when we went to OCS and then later Supply Corps School together. He was one of the funniest people. One of the great memories I have of those years, uh, the, those months of training, was the funny people I met. I mean, just wonderful personalities. And uh, we had a great time. But I went to OCS at Newport, Rhode Island. It was the hottest I've ever been and the coldest I've ever been in one form one period. Because we started at the uh, heat, the height of the heat season in Newport and the humidity in uh, July, and then we ended in November. In fact, we were commissioned uh, about two hours before President Kennedy was assassinated. Wow. So we all remember where we were that day. <laughs> well, what was the uh, reaction to that? I mean, you just been commissioned, and the president gets killed. What? What? Well, your, you we your... were. I, my parents had come up from D.C. to go to the graduation. I was really proud of getting out of OCS because I was a history major in college, and I'd never had any kind of technical mm -hmm. uh, courses. And we had navigation and engineering and celestial navigation and all kinds of other stuff, and it, it was hard for me. And uh, so I was happy to have finished in the top uh, quarter of the class, I guess. And the um, so they come up, came up, and I had met a girl the week before, and so I had a date for the OCS ball the night before, and we were taking her back to Providence, Rhode Island, and I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I'll probably never see this girl again. What am I going to say? Now, at this point, we had not been listening to the radio. We were just talking and playing word games and stuff in the car and having a good time, and we got to her house, which was a working-class neighborhood in Providence, Rhode Island, and I opened the door, went around, opened the door for her to get her, uh, let her out of the car. And her sister came running out of the house. Now, you know, Providence, Rhode Island was Kennedy territory. Mm -hmm. And uh, her eyes were swollen, her face was all red, and she said, the president's been assassinated. And we were just flummoxed. And yeah. we said, well, goodbye. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, I really didn't have a chance to interact with any of my fellow students in the Navy yeah. at that point because we were already on leave. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, the next two weeks while I was on leave, I just had to kind of watch the news and yeah. see whether I was going to be sent to some place in Russia or what. Yeah. <laughs> and um, as it turned out, nothing changed. I wound up in Athens, Georgia, going to Supply Corps School. Well, talk about your training and where you went and what you were being trained to do and any okay. experiences that you'd like to share. Well, in the Navy, at least in those days, all naval officers had to go through the same basic course. They called it uh, in the paperwork, indoctrination, that was the same. You had to learn how to drive ships. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter whether you were going to be engineering or fly airplanes or what you were going to do. That's your basic course. So all the supply officers had to do that. And then um, typically a guy who went to the supply corps in the Navy would either had bad vision like me or they were colorblind. And so I had a lot of classmates who were colorblind that went down to uh, Athens, Georgia to go through the huh. Navy Supply Corps School. And that was a six month called the Basic Qualification Course and become a shipboard supply officer. Okay. And uh, it was very good. Uh, looking back on it, I spent the last 25 years of my life in the training industry. And uh, I have to say the training I got in the Navy was among the best one could ever get. Uh, but the basic qualification course for the supply officer in Athens was very good. Plus, uh, being a young single ensign down there was a, was a great experience. I met my wife there. You did? Yeah, yeah. so uh, in fact, I met her in February. I got there in mid-December. The class started, I think, in January. And when I graduated in June, it was, 
I didn't know it at the time, but it was all over for me <laughs> and for her. Uh, we got married about a year right. about a year later. Right. And uh, and that was about the time I left for Vietnam. So what they trained us to do in uh, in Athens was to run an entire shipboard supply department that included uh, being the paymaster, being in charge of ships uh, repair parts and stores, running the food service and running the retail store aboard the ship. And they used the model of being a destroyer supply officer. And in those days, and probably still is, the destroyer supply officer job was kind of the, the proving ground for a young supply officer. If you could do that, you could do anything because you were the junior department head in most cases and uh, you had everything aboard the ship that had anything to do with supply was your responsibility. And uh, there were, you didn't have any assistance except, of course, usually you had an E8 or E7, E8 or E9 as your assistant, usually an E7, and uh, probably a storekeeper or a commissary. Man. So uh, that scared me half out of my wits. And I actually <laughs> I did a really stupid thing at the time. I made the conscious decision not to graduate uh, in the upper half of the class. And that was extremely difficult for me to go into a test and answer the questions wrong <laughs> on purpose. And why did you do that? Because if you were in the top, uh, roughly the top half of the class, you had a real good chance of getting a destroyer when you got out. And I did not want that experience. Yeah. And as it turned out, it was a bad mistake because I wanted my dream job was uh, the USS uh, uh, Sylvania which was a brand new ship at that time. It was a combination stores and oiler uh, fuel ship, as I recall. Anyway, it was a new ship concept and they were commissioning it in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I had applied for that and the guy in front of me got it. Really? <laughs> <laughs> so I wound up going to an ammunition ship in the Atlantic Service Force. Okay. Now it was a good job. It was what they call a fleet up billet. And I was adequately prepared for it. I was the assistant supply officer I had dispersing and commissary. That was food service. And uh, my boss had the ship store and being the supply officer. And he was a Lieutenant JG and I was an ensign. And um, he was a good guy. He, in fact, we remained friends for a long time after that, even after uh, I got out of the Navy. Um, he was uh, extremely bright and it was easy to follow him in, uh, in the work that he did there. But the dispersing officer on the ship is a very important job. Back in those days, all the sailors got paid by cash, unless they specifically requested a check. And you'd find that the older guys would let their pay accumulate. And then when they got back in port from a cruise or something, they'd have a whole bunch of money mm -hmm. for their families yeah. or for whatever they wanted if they yeah. didn't have a family. Yeah. Uh, but the younger guys always took their money in cash, and usually it was gone within two days. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was an inter interesting experience because you had to balance your check your books every day. And uh, that was a big joke because uh, uh, it wasn't a joke if you didn't balance. It was difficult. And for a guy like me who never has been able to balance a checkbook, that was extremely difficult. So that was probably the hardest job I've ever had, okay. was trying to keep track of that money. <laughs> I actually had a drawer in my safe. <laughs> that had a bunch of nickels and dimes and quarters in it and, and a couple of dollar bills because I was always coming out 42 cents off. So I just put the money in and I would take it out. <laughs> and, you know, it, it just it was odd. Uh, it was a hard job balancing that checkbook. Tell us about your experiences when you went to sea, where you went, what your day-to-day -day responsibilities were, what you observed. Yeah. Uh, you didn't mention the name of your ship. Oh, the ship was, uh, I, didn't, I didn't have a ship until I got out of Supply Corps School and I got orders to the USS Wrangell, W-R-A-N-G-E-L-L, -L, AE-12. AE stands for, I think, uh, Auxiliary Explosive. <laughs> because uh, uh, it's called an AE, and uh, the AEs, were all named after volcanoes or explosive substances. So when I was on active duty, there was also a Mount Hood, for example. There was uh, the Nitro, the Pyro were ships. And these were, all of these were uh, World War II vintage ships, most of them 20 to 25 years old, uh, that had been 
appropriated or purchased by the Navy during their construction as merchant vessels. So uh, if you saw a picture of this thing, it looks just like it's a cargo ship. You know, it's got four holes and rigging and all that sort of thing. Um, so it, it, was, um, it was outfitted originally. It had uh, two uh, three-inch 50 guns uh, on the bow and two five-inch 30 guns on the stern. Well, guns on an ammunition ship are not real useful because if you start getting attacked, it's pretty much over. Uh, you're not, the ship is not maneuverable enough to really avoid, uh, for example, in the Western Pacific, a kamikaze or a submarine. Yeah. So um, they, when I was on the ship, they had removed the after guns, and uh, there was just a couple of big round uh, circular places back there where they called gun tubs where the guns had set. Okay. Subsequently, those were removed and they put a helo platform back okay. there. But that's where we, when we were on our Vietnam cruise, we used to um, get our mail and our movies and all that on the yeah. fan tail back there because those guns were gone. The okay. helos could come down low enough to, to drop. We actually, I have a video, it's an old 8mm uh, movie that's very blurry of a guy in a helicopter hovering on our fan tail while we we're underway. Now this, this guy was a heck of a helicopter driver because the ship is going like this. I mean, it, it's yawing and, and uh, rolling and pitching and the helicopter's just staying right with us this way. And he didn't hit any rigging or anything. Wow. And he picked up a passenger. Really? And uh, you can see the guy going up. And it, even though it's boring, you can see him being pulled into the chopper. Oh, and then gosh. gradually he pulled back. So uh, it was a lot of really great, uh, interesting things that happened. But the ship was in the med when I got orders. And this would have been 1964? Right. This was in, the, in June of 64. Okay. So I flew over there. It's probably the first week of July. She was in the last 30 days of a mid cruise, which is a great disappointment to me, because you know I joined the Navy to be on a ship mm -hmm. and uh, go places, and um, they'd already gone to all the cool places like Italy and <laughs> France and all that. So I did uh, have an interesting wait for the ship and rode to Spain. I had flew over there and had three days there just to hang around mm -hmm. uh, while I was waiting for the ship to come into port, and. Uh, had a memorable visit to Seville uh, the night before the ship came in. We, I didn't know when it was coming in. And so I went over there. There was an Air Force civilian there who could speak Italian and Spanish and French as well as English. And uh, two E-9 chiefs from an aircraft carrier were there waiting for their, for some reason, they had been off the ship and now they're waiting for it to come into port. So uh, the four of us went out and had dinner in Seville. And we stayed there virtually all night and wound up sleeping on the side of the road on the way back because <laughs> nobody could stay awake. <laughs> Those chiefs were out like that when that, when that car got underway. Uh, forgot, I tried to stay awake to keep the driver awake, and we both just passed out, I guess. But it was a, it was a fun experience. That was, really, uh, that, was, that was a great introduction to senior enlisted people for me because they were just fun you know, ordinary, yeah. wonderful, intelligent guys. Yeah. And the uh, ship came in port, I went aboard, um, got introduced around, uh, went through the relieving process. The guy that I was relieving left and caught his plane home and then the ship went to sea. And we spent a month in the med and then uh, we came back to Norfolk. That fall, we went to Dublin, Ireland. There was a big exercise uh, with Fiblant, uh, at the amphibious force, the Atlantic Fleet. And they had about 45 or 50 ships that went all the way across the Atlantic. Fortunately, we went on the southern route, so it was like glass move for 30 days. Hmm. And we did all this steaming at night in uh, formation without lights, you know, practice. Hmm. And um, they put me on the watch bill. Normally, a supply officer does not stand underway watches, but the ship was short in the wardroom to round out the watch bill. And typically, you have uh, three watches. And so, uh, they, the spa officer and I both stood underway watches, and I liked being on the bridge. It was fun. Ultimately, I got qualified as an officer in the deck underway, but the captain couldn't bear to give me a full qualification because I was a pork chop. That's what they call spa officers. So I got underway uh, 
qualified for underway steaming, independent steaming, OOD, under, underway independent steaming, which meant no other ships around. But that's where I used all that stuff I learned at OCS. Yeah. You know, a maneuvering board, how to take pos yeah. position, and yeah. it's, uh, for those of you who flew helicopters, it would have been a piece of cake, but for me, it was really a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Understanding relative motion. So uh, we had a port of call in Dublin, Ireland, which was really, really a memorable experience. We came back, and that winter, we went for two months to the Caribbean on exercises. And uh, then uh, we went back and forth to Bayonne, New Jersey. And I think by that time, uh, we got a new skipper uh, that spring. And I think he knew that we were going to go to Vietnam. Uh, it wasn't commonly known, but then the rumors started going, you know. In the meantime, I'm getting married. And uh, then the ship, sure enough, gets orders to go. And we left in September of 1965. And... Uh, so I'd been aboard just a little over a year at that time. I'd made, uh, I'd become the supply officer and uh, in that fleet up billet. And so we, we left, uh, by that time we changed our home port too. We had been in Norfolk, now we moved to Charleston, okay. which was really a, a great experience because Charleston didn't have that many ships. It was, it was mostly a submarine base at that time. And so the people in Charleston really thought we were cool. Or the people in Norfolk thought we were a bunch of sailors, you know, <laughs> yeah. sort of dogs and sailors yeah. stay off the yard kind of thing. It was, um, but we weren't there very long. And I remember I left my my bride, my pregnant bride, in uh, in uh, Charleston in a little rented apartment, a, a duplex, and I had not read the lease carefully, and it said for two people. So somehow along the way, she figured that out. I don't know if somebody told her or what. Because when I came back, we were going to have to move. Well, she moved on her own, which was, I was really impressed with that. And she found a great apartment right outside the back gate there to the, uh, the naval station. And that's where we lived when I came back from Vietnam. But um, we left in uh, September. We got over there in November. It took, um, it took us a month and a half to make the cruise over. So we left, uh, went through the Panama Canal. An interesting thing I remember about that is the, the senior chief bosun mate opened all the water main cocks on the ship and pumped fresh water from that lake throughout the fire mains and everything, which meant all those barnacles and mm -hmm. all that dirty salt water and everything that was in there got pumped into that freshwater lake. I bet you couldn't do that today. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> But nobody thought about it. I mean, it was it was a non-issue for anybody. There were no rules against it, and we thought, you know, this lake is so big. I can't remember that Rodman Lake Rodman, I think it is. And uh, but I remember it's just huge. And we were in there for about a half a day. So he cleaned out the fire mains while we were in there. Then we uh, we exited the Panama Canal and steamed to Hawaii. And we were there about two days, and I got a chance to get off the ship for an afternoon and eat some pineapple. Boy, was it sweet. And then uh, we spent the next, that took about two weeks, and we spent the next month going to the Philippines. Crossed the International Dateline on a Saturday, unfortunately, so we had to work seven days in a row. Um, we got to Subic Bay. We offloaded, when we were in Hawaii, we unloaded so much gear that they had used planks, wooden planks, on top of rocket fins on the deck. We were deck loaded. So not everything went in the, in the hold. And uh, so these planks were walkways, so you could go fore and aft on the ship. Uh, but we were loaded, you, the, the black line around the hull of the ship was underwater. Hmm. We were so uh, far loaded. She rode great. <laughs> she drawn about two feet more than normal. You know? And uh, we got there, we offloaded all of our stuff, and then uh, unloaded our first uh, combat load which was mostly 500 pound bombs and 3 inch 50 and 5 inch 30 rounds for the destroyers. And I'm sure we had some rockets and some other things. Um, and the routine was two weeks at sea, uh, replenishing the ammunition supplies of other ships, and one week in port loading up. And uh, one of the interesting things about being in the supply department and running that is that when we're at sea, we're busy. 
because we're feeding three to four, sometimes five meals a day. We're, we got the laundry running, we got the ship store running, we got spare parts being issued, and when we go to port, we have to have payday. All that stuff's going on all the time. Then we get into port, and we're, we're doing the same thing. And plus, we're loading on new supplies, we're replenishing our stores, we're getting fresh food, fresh milk, fresh vegetables, and that sort of thing. And uh, the line guys are all off because the stevedores are loading the ship, not our ship's crew. So they're all uh, basically not doing nothing, but their workload is significantly yeah. lighter. Yeah. Now the engineering guys had a little work to do because they were on maintenance and so on. But it was it was an interesting experience being in that kind of a, it was a very uh, rigorous schedule. If you got a day off, it was uh, because you were at sea and there was nobody to come alongside that day. But typically we work seven days a week yeah. uh, at sea. We got into port, we would often get uh, Sundays off. When we were steaming over, we had Sundays off. It was a day of rest. Then um, we had uh, two ports of call in Taiwan for recreation. One at Christmas time. We spent Christmas time in Kaohsiung, Taiwan. And I remember going, we had a chaplain that served aboard the ship for uh, a two-week period. And they used to have these chaplains that would rotate around the ships. And he was, you know, he was a Navy lieutenant commander. And he was a fairly senior guy. He was probably 50, um, which is pretty old for a lieutenant commander. But what a great guy. Everybody just loved this man. And he had one of these melodious voices and every night, he would say a prayer over the ship's speaker system. It was like the voice of God. I mean, it was just beautiful. And there was a peace when he was on that ship. There was a peace that was inexplicable. The captain loved this guy. And uh, we all did. I mean, he was just very popular. He did a lot of counseling, one-on-one -on -one counseling with the, the sailors and with the officers, too. And the captain liked him so much that he requested that he come back. So we got him for another two weeks that winter, hmm. and uh, and he he was glad to be on board. The uh, our captain wrote him such a glowing recommendation that he got promoted to commander, okay. and he was at retirement age, yeah. and he was uh, he was a wonderful guy, and we were just thrilled to hear that he got got promoted. Right. Uh, he had run afoul of somewhere in his somebody somewhere in his career, and uh, but he was a wonderful minister. I just remember that we'd have. Sh We'd have church back on the uh, uh, on the hatch cover of the, the I guess it was the third hatch. Uh, I forgot how whether we had them numbered one, two, three, four, or what, but it was right there behind the superstructure. And we'd set up chairs out there, and uh, that's where we had church. And the uh, we'd had chaplains on before, particularly if we were in port. Um, I remember once we had a chaplain. He was he was a buffoon. Um, he was a reservist, yeah. and he came on board for two weeks, you know. <laughs> and I just, you know, he was not in the least bit spiritual. He was yeah. just having a good time. He was a lot of fun, but he wasn't much. Wasn't did much did you have a fair amount of contact with civilians when you would go into these port towns? Um, <laughs> only in the bars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was really a, a difficult thing for me being gone for nine months from my wife. My first, our first child was born when I was gone. She was two months old when I got back. Um, <clears throat> I remember my wife sent me a picture of her pregnant, wearing her little two-piece bathing suit, and she was standing sideways in a profile. It looked like an olive, a toothpick with an olive on it, because she's a real little person. I, and I just couldn't believe it when I saw that picture. So I didn't see my wife pregnant until the second child. Yeah. Uh, after I got out of the Navy. We, um, we communicated, obviously, by letter, but we also used tape, cassettes. And uh, interesting, I learned later that audio cassettes were invented in 1965. So we didn't have cassettes. We had little reel-to-reel. -reel. I think I said cassettes, but we had reel-to-reel -reel tapes. And they were little ones, about this big, and we had these little baby players, and she had one and I had one. And, and the military had sold these things in the exchange and uh, we had them in the ship store. And you could uh, you buy them, and they, it came with uh, an extra reel, and you could um, 
make your tape and send it off to your family or your loved ones. I remember once he sent me a tape of the baby crying. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I finally fast forwarded him. Mean, yeah. <laughs> it kept sounding the same to me. Of course, you know, I didn't really bond with the child until I got home. Yeah. She was so cute. Yeah. Um, and she's now the mother of five. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. Yeah. But <clears throat> that, uh, that part was very difficult for me. Now, you, at this point, you were, you say, in the port, then at sea for two weeks, or how, how was that? Yeah, we were in, in port in Subic Bay in the Philippine Islands for a week, roughly, and then at sea for roughly two weeks. Then we come back in and load up again. Now, you previously, before we started this, you described a process of loading ammo that I thought was very yeah. interesting and you might want to get on this. Well, story. when... Uh, when the ship was in port, obviously, it was, uh, it was really just bringing barges alongside and loading stuff. You've you got to keep in mind, this is just a big merchant vessel converted to Navy use, and so we have big holes and four decks, and you loaded stuff in certain places, and it was all recorded where the stuff was. And our primary cargo were 500-pound bombs, which, you know, thousands of them were dropped on North Vietnam uh, from our Navy aircraft. So we would go to sea... And the rule of, uh, was that when you're serving, you're the service force, whether you're an oiler or an ammo ship or a food, um, a food ship, um, I forgot what they call them, uh, it's been a while. The, um, uh, the other, the combatant ships would take station on you. So we would agree up on a course and we'd be steaming in this direction. And on the port side would come all the large ships. So we always had an aircraft carrier or a cruiser on our port. On the starboard side, we get the destroyer escorts and the destroyers and the other small ships of various kinds. So it would be fairly common for us to have a carrier on our port side and we'd be sending 500 pound bombs from three or four stations on high wire transfers or high line transfers. This is essentially where you attach a, a line to their ship and one to our ship and then you, you our guy controls it so that the bomb doesn't go flying off into the sky somewhere or it doesn't get dunked in the water because right. the ships are going like this and like this and it's probably the first hand-eye coordination for guys that became expert at video games yeah. <laughs> later. But these kids were really good. Most of them were 18, 19, 20 years old and they were, they were it was interesting to watch their faces, you know, because they were intent. And so we'd have a, a big ship on our port side and then a small boy, as we call them, a smaller ship on our starboard. And we'd be sending over big racks of, of ammunition to them, 3-inch 50 rounds for their guns or other things. And occasionally we'd have to sell them uh, food or uh, some kind of parts or supplies that we had that we could share with them. And there's a requisition process that you use for that. And they'd send it over and we'd send them wherever we could. Yeah. And if we had just come from... Uh, loading up and we had fresh vegetables for example or fruit or milk we would often sell it to them because okay. we're going to be back in two weeks they might be out for 30 days yeah. or more. Now how long were you on this particular cruise? We were in the uh, country so to speak yeah. or in that area for six months okay. so we got there in November we left at the end of May. And where did you go when you left? We went uh, with the rest of the way around the world. Okay. Um, I got to see Vietnam once. I'll talk about that. Yeah, we were steaming south and somebody said, hey, you want to see Vietnam? And I went out on the after quarter, de after well deck back there and he said, there it is over there. <laughs> and uh, you could see the land off in the distance. Yeah, okay. It was probably three miles yeah. or so. Okay. And uh, it was hazy that day. Yeah. So I do remember that when it came time to leave, uh, it was the end of May, and for about two weeks before we left, the weather became oppressively humid. Now you guys are in the Army or Marines, remember that yeah. uh, differently because you had to live with that every day. And uh, being in, out at sea, at least occasionally we'd have a breeze that could help out. But I can remember sitting in my office and paper would just stick to you because yeah. your body was just glistening. And of yeah. course we had a lot of paper in those days. Yeah. We, um, we left there uh, after being relieved by another ship, another ammunition ship, and we went south, uh, across the equator, had a shellback ceremony with the garbage chutes and the whole thing. I think we had, 
We had 330 some odd people on the ship, and about 20 of them were shellbacks, and so they got to the that rest of us through for misery. People who, yeah, describe what the shellback is for people who will be a shellback is somebody who has been on a ship and crossed the equator. Okay, it's just that and gone through a ceremony. Yeah. Okay. And the ceremony is uh, this character King Neptune comes aboard the ship, and you have to go through a um, a process of being approved or showing yourself worthy of becoming a shellback, and, and it's uh, it's really a disgusting thing. I mean, <laughs> we uh, as officers we had to wear our let's see how did that work? I think they had us put our trousers on upside down, which was kind of an interesting challenge. We had our hats without a hat cover. Now, most people, that didn't mean anything to them, but a Navy officer's hat is a frame. And you change the cover depending on which uniform you're wearing. So you take the cover off, and you just got this funky-looking plastic frame <laughs> with a bill on it. It's completely worthless, and it looks really stupid. Um, we had... Uh, we wore our shirts inside out, and we had, uh, I remember I wore old clothes because one of the things they did was they saved garbage on the fantail for a week and a half. Uh, the fantail's the back of the ship, and so that, I didn't know it was back there. Uh, but they, uh, they, they, the guys guarded that. They had guards on it, and it got really rank because it was hot, you know, during the day. And they made a chute. The carpenters made this shoot out of canvas and, and two by fours, and it was about 15 or 20 feet long, and it was full of garbage and seawater. And you had to crawl through that thing, and then you landed in a pool. They literally had a kind of a wading pool there, and it was filled with garbage. <laughs> and uh, you had to kiss the baby's uh, belly, so they had this big fat guy there, and uh, you know they had you blindfolded. So you kiss the baby's belly and say, okay, kiss the baby's belly. And, it, and he would stick this wooden paddle right there. She didn't actually kiss his skin. Yeah. But, I mean, every guy on that ship thought he was kissing this guy's belly. Uh. Uh, it was funny. Uh, I got to, after I did it, I got to watch it for a while. It, yeah. was, it was just hilarious. And the captain was also, they call you a polywog when you're not a shellback. They, our captain was a polywog. So... Um, he had to go through the same thing yeah. the rest of us did. And I remember when that was day was over, I threw my clothes over the side. <laughs> Except for the hat. <laughs> so uh, we are, I have a little certificate. Uh, in fact, if we have time later, I'll show okay. it to you. And um, and so I'm an official shellback. Congratulations. We, yeah, thank you. We went down, uh, then we came across the equator, then we came back up a little bit, and we spent three days in uh, Singapore. And we had uh, a host ship serve us there. And Singapore at that time was a protectorate of the uh, United Kingdom. So there was an English uh, frigate in port, and they were our host ship. And those guys were great. They treated us like we were kings. Now, being an ammunition ship, nobody would ever let us moor alongside the pier, even though we were safer than that frigate, because none of our ammo was armed, where theirs was armed. Uh, so, but... Nonetheless, I mean, we were all over the world, and we never got to more alongside a pier except yeah. in Norfolk or Charleston. Yeah. And uh, so we were anchored out, but they, we got to eat in the wardrobe over there. And, of course, the British ships, uh, they have their grog ration. The sailors get two pints of ale a day, mm -hmm. and the officers have a bar in their wardroom. So couldn't drink during the day, but that was frowned upon. But you could mm -hmm. at night you could have a glass of wine or a drink yeah. with your meal. And uh, I abused that, uh, as did several of my uh, shipmates. And then um, we left there and went to Beirut, Lebanon, which was quite an interesting experience. I'd never seen anything like that. Uh, we spent two days in Beirut. I just remember being the harbor was dirty. The um, you know there were people lying in the street. You know those striped places in the roads mm -hmm. where traffic's not supposed to drive. There were people lying there. And uh, just, I remember taking a picture of a cow that was just wandering around the park, untethered, and I was, had my camera up, you know, and I'm taking a picture of this cow, and, and I looked around like this, and there were about six guys watching me very intently to see what I was going to do, whether I was going to harm that cow or not, because they think that perhaps 
part of Hinduism is the cow may have been a, one of their ancestors yeah. or something. You come yeah. back and you might come back as a cow or a rat or something huh. else. But I just remember it being a really different place. Yeah. Really some beautiful crafts there. Uh, workmanship was really something. And then we left there and went up to the Suez Canal. Um, that was the hottest probably I've ever experienced. It, uh, it was, as they say, it was a dry heat. But it was like 120. And so our ship's work would start at 5 a.m. and it was still relatively cool. And the hottest part of the day was after 2 o'clock. So we would knock off ship's work at 2. Lunch was served around, as I recall, around 10 or 10.30 uh, every day. And then we'd go back to work for a couple hours. And, then we, and the crew's sleeping quarters were all air-conditioned, and the officer's ward room was air-conditioned. Those were the only two spaces on the ship that were air-conditioned. And air, so, you know, yeah. to be cool, I mean, a big ship like that's nothing but a giant tin can, yeah. you know, steel. And it was really hot. I remember the uh, being... Uh, out on the, I guess I must have been on one, out watching, looking at the desert as we went up the canal, and a boat came alongside, and a an Arab came aboard, and I remember him being dressed in that traditional Arab garb with the long robes and the turban, and he had on sunglasses, and he was the ship's pilot, and he was going to pilot us through the locks in the canal. Oh, okay. So he came aboard, and we had to escort him up to the. Uh, up to the bridge, and the captain XO welcomed him aboard, and he took control of the ship and took us through the locks, and, and we came out. Uh, I was busy, so I didn't get to spend much time out on the. And besides that, it was so hot; it wasn't any fun to be yeah, out there. Yeah. Then uh, we steamed into the Mediterranean and went to Beirut, Lebanon, and this was before there were any hostilities in Beirut, so it was just a wonderfully big, beautiful city. I just remember that; it, it wasn't. I don't remember anything special about it because I didn't know enough to know what to look for. But I just I remember the it looked like a banking center. There were banks everywhere, big office buildings, and so on. Then our next port of call was uh, Barcelona, Spain. I remember my shipmate Jack Ritchie bought a Rolex watch for two hundred dollars, <laughs> one of the oyster yeah. watches, yeah. and we said. Two hundred dollars for a watch? Gosh, that's a lot of money, Jack. All he said, this thing will be worth a lot more than that later. Just imagine, what are they now? Two grand? Yeah. And uh, Jack's probably still got that Rolex. Um, so we had, uh, and of course everybody that was married just wanted to go home. Yeah. And uh, after two days in Barcelona, we left and steamed straight across the Atlantic, came home. The shortest route from the Med to Norfolk or Charleston is what they call the Northern Route. And you come through the North Atlantic, which is almost always rough. And I don't remember, I think, I'm pretty darn sure we came the Northern Route. It wasn't that bad, as I recall. This was, would have been in mid-June of 1966. I don't remember it being particularly rough. The first time I made that trip was the first time I ever got seasick. It was when I'd been on the ship for a month. The med was calm, so I never noticed the ship being moving very much. When we hit that, uh, that rough weather, and I guess this was in 64, coming back from the Mediterranean, I was standing watch on the first watch. That's the one from, uh, I guess the second watch. It's the one from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. So you get up there at 4 a.m., it's pitch dark. I could feel the ship moving, but I couldn't see anything. And I knew that we were in rough water. But as the day, as the sun rose, I could see the green water coming over the bow. Now, this ship was about 20 feet off the water, so these are big waves. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that wow. was it for me. Wow. And the officer of the deck was an old salty Mustang lieutenant. He said, Ensign Walker, you look a little green around the gills. Why don't you go down and have some breakfast? <laughs> Which is probably the worst thing I could do. And I get down there, and what does the cook have? But pancakes. Oh. <laughs> I want to ask you. I want to clarify clarify one thing. The stop before Beirut was that Calcutta, Bombay. Bombay. Okay. Yeah, wanna, we went to Singapore. Then sure everything was that. a B. Bombay, Beirut, okay. Barcelona. Okay, I want to be sure we got that on there. Yeah. Okay. It was Bombay, India. The. Um, okay. Well, where Where'd you go after the pancakes? <laughs> I went to uh, the head <laughs> to get rid of the pancakes, and then I spent the next 24 hours on my rack. Yeah. I was absolutely 
that's the worst sickness if you've never been seasick. I don't know, Tony, you might have experienced that, but it's the worst sickness that there is. But you know, there is such a thing as getting your sea legs, because I was never seasick again while I was on active duty. And I got out, and a year later, as a reservist, went back aboard a ship. We got underway for two days, for a one day, for a dependence cruise, and I was down doing a project in a storeroom in the forward part of the ship, which means, you know, the forward and the after parts of the ship travel more when the ship is pitching in the sea. And so if I'd have been on the bridge, I'd have hardly noticed it probably, but that, that storeroom was traveling about 40 feet one way or the other. <laughs> I lasted about 20 minutes down there. <laughs> I said, guys, you're going to finish this project without me. <laughs> when you went into town on these various ports of call, did you ever have any discussion with civilians about Vietnam or get any indication of what they thought of the whole situation there? I never did. I was so politically naive at that time, I didn't really know that, mm -hmm. that uh, there was any problem. Yeah. And of course the real unpopularity of the war hadn't started right. yet. This was in 65 and 66. Yeah. And it was really 69, 70, 71, 72, that's when people really were getting the negative experiences. I can remember um, All I remember is, you know, getting a great deal on custom-made suits in Hong Kong, yeah. and uh, I wore those for years yeah. until I outgrew them. And then uh, when I, uh, when we were in the Med, I had shore patrol duty in Bombay on the way back, and uh, that might have been when we were over there the first time. Anyway, I remember sitting on the fleet landing uh, where the boats came and went. And all I was just there to make sure the sailors didn't do anything bad, and it was in the middle of the afternoon, so it was pretty good for me because I was off duty, so to speak, sitting there. And there's a Italian or a Spanish policeman there, and this was right after General Relisimo Franco had uh, been relieved and died. Uh, and I guess he died, and, and uh, so the country was making a transition from being under his rule. And everywhere you went, there were these La Guardia Seville, these guys in the green uniforms with the three-pointed, mm -hmm. three-cornered caps. And they had a guy like that, only he was by himself. Normally they were in pairs. He was by himself at the fleet landing, and he was in a little booth. And so I struck up a conversation with him, and I knew zero Spanish, and he knew zero English. We talked for two hours. Wow. And I found out that he had three kids, and that uh, he'd been a policeman for, I think, ten years, and... You know, all this, uh, somehow we got yeah. we got the information back and forth. It was a very uh, interesting experience. That really was an eye-opener for me. Was he very interested in America and what went on in America? Or He was interested in uh, American people mm -hmm. uh, more than America. Yeah. I mean, he was happy. He was a happy man. Right. Um, yeah, there was no discontent for him, so I don't think he had any kind of interest in America other than uh, curiosity. Now, where was your termination point on this cruise? Well, we, uh, we came back um, to Charleston, and uh, it was a big deal. We had a uh, band on the pier, and of course, all we wanted to do was get off the ship and go home, but we had to go to a Navy League luncheon, be welcomed home. That was, that was a wonderful uh, welcome home, really. Uh, but the Navy League treated the USS Rangel like we were something special. Um, and we were just an old cargo ship, you know, that... Uh, now, you were still something special, though. Yeah, we were to them, anyway. And we came back, uh, they, uh, they, had, they had pictures in the newspaper, um, and in special interest stories and so on, so it was kind of, kind of neat. The ship was scheduled to go into the shipyards, because she hadn't been in the yards for a number of years, and there were some major modifications that had to be made to her um, radar and they were going to take those gun tubs off the back and put a helo platform on it which was going to increase the serviceability of the ship dramatically and uh, they in, in on a navy ship they call the cafeteria that we would call it in civilian life they call it the mess deck and the mess deck had the worst air conditioning you could ever imagine and the reason was that the dishwashing area known as the scullery was open the, the walls or the bulkheads of the scullery were made out of wire mesh. Um, 
And so they were going to remodel the mess deck and put a new air conditioner in it. By the way, they had to cut a hole inside the ship to get the air conditioning unit in. And so I remember having this big knockdown drag out with a ship su shipyard superintendent because they had the plans from World War II for this scullery. Well, guess what? It was the same as the one we had with wire mesh walls or bulkheads. And I said, this is not going to work, and I'm not going to sign off on this. Read my lips, so to speak. I'm not signing this. And I went to the captain and explained the problem, because what would happen is you, you have to have um, the rinse water to be 150 degrees or something in a Navy ship. I mean, it's hot. So you have steam by clouds coming right into the area where the guys are eating, mm -hmm. and that air conditioning is trying to draw all that steam moisture out of that steam and so the air conditioning was always broken. Yeah. And uh, so I insisted that they put stainless steel bulkheads in there and a vent fan. Well, they were concerned about the ship's integrity. I said, well, put a dog hatch on it or something so you can close it, but you've got to figure out how to do this because I'm not signing off on it. So it was took two or three weeks, but we finally got it, got done. Got it done. We also, that was when I first realized that my skill set was probably not being a supply officer, it was probably being a project manager. Because one of the things that a supply department on a ship has to have is a validation of their equipment. And back in those days, they had something called a coordinated ship, um, I can't remember what it stood for, but it was, a, it was an old spare parts allowance list. It was literally computer, those old green, line computer printouts, the stack was that thick. It was every spare part that went with every piece of equipment on that ship. So when they when they brought a ship into the yard, what they would do is uh, take all the spare parts from all the storerooms off the ship and put them in a big warehouse. Then you had to do an inventory of all the equipment that you had on the ship and see if it matched up to the parts. Because about half of our part didn't match any of the stuff that was on the ship. We had stuff on there from the 1940s that had never been used. And we had equipment that had been replaced and they hadn't updated the parts allowance. Well, the difficult thing about that is the supplier's responsibility to make that happen. But the people that have to do the work are from other departments. And it took a major sales job to get the chief engineer to give me a competent machinist mate, for example, to be able to understand the significance of what we were doing. And we twisted his, he finally agreed and gave me a second class, an E5, that I know he made chief if he stayed in the Navy. He was one smart dude. And uh, he basically ran that whole project, the second class did. And uh, it was going great, and that's when I got out. Uh, it was the end of my tour, but the ship was in the yards when I left, okay. and uh, that was back when we used to do some horse trading. Um, I made sure, with the cooperation from the ship's bosun's mate, uh, that uh, the shipyard snack area for the workers, the managers and everything, the supervisors, had plenty of canned ham. Because <laughs> those canned hams cost the Navy about five bucks. But they would buy us hundreds and hundreds of dollars worth of services and yeah. and additional equipment and stuff that they were going to throw out that we'd get to use. Mainly, it was them doing things for us that were uh, a favor that weren't in part of the specs. And uh, so I made darn sure that we had plenty of canned ham. <laughs> <laughs> Smart man. <laughs> when after you got out of the navy, uh, tell us a little bit about what you did with. Uh, mm. Well, when I got out, career after that. Yeah, the, the economy was in pretty good shape then, and it wasn't that hard finding another job, and um, being a veteran was actually a plus. Um, and I think having been an officer was also a benefit to me. I mean, I could talk a little bit about having run a ship's department. I, I, was, 20, um, I was 23 years old when I became a dispersing officer. I was 24 as a department head. I had 32 people working for me. I didn't know what I was doing, but somehow we muddled through. So I had experience way beyond my years 
as a result of, the, of my time in the Navy. Um, I was so uh, turned off by the big organization of the U.S. Navy and all the bureaucracy that was involved and the difficulty in getting things changed if you needed, like that thing about the scullery, the dishwashing area. I mean, it was like a common sense didn't matter. You know? And I said, never again am I going to be involved in a big organization. Never. So instead of going to work for IBM or GE in one of their management training programs, which really would have been a smart thing, I looked for jobs with small companies. And uh, <laughs> I turned down a job in Columbia, South Carolina to be an outside sales guy for a chemical company to take a job in the D.C. area that paid, uh, I think it was $200 a year more. Of course, the cost of living was about $5,000 a year difference, but I didn't know there was such a thing as a cost of living. It, it just, I just was naive. But uh, I got my first job going from door to door in the Westgate Research Park in McLean, Virginia, knocking on doors and saying, hey, I'm looking for a job as a sales guy. Are you looking to hire a salesman? And somebody said, well, yeah, as a matter of fact, we are. And I got a job. So it, it, I actually had that job before we moved from Charleston to uh, D.C. <clears throat> and uh, we rented an apartment, and within a year we bought our first house. And uh, we lived up there 13 years, and I joined the Navy Reserve and had a great time in the Reserves and um, wound up staying in Reserves for the rest of my 20 years, actually 22 years, and retired from the Reserves in 1992 as a captain. Congratulations. Yeah, 06. Yeah, I was... Nobody was more surprised than me. <laughs> should be proud, too. I am. I am. It was a great experience. A wonderful experience. In fact, I was a terrific Navy Reserve officer. I would have been terrible on acting. <laughs> and the reason is the jobs are different. In the Reserves, you are focused on uh, short-term projects and a plan to get your unit up to snuff so you could go to war if you needed to. And my final tour was commanding officer of reserve unit, that, and we had a checklist we had to get done. And I remember uh, that was after the Forrestal fire, and uh, everybody in the Navy at that point had to go through firefighting school. So forget about a reserve unit getting quotas to go to firefighting school. They just weren't available to us. But that was one of the things we had to have to get qualified as our unit to get qualified. And so one of my... Uh, I guess it was one of my chief petty officers had a buddy who was a fireman with the DeKalb County Fire Department. He said, I could ask him, maybe they would teach us. I said, go for it, man. So we spent one whole Saturday and half of a Sunday at the DeKalb County Fire Department. We went through that burning tower thing, rescued the baby, <laughs> found the mat the burning mattress, the whole thing. Uh, but I loved, I loved that job, being CO over reserve unit. Yeah. It's probably the best job I've ever had in my whole life. You brought a framed picture of your ship, yeah. and we would like to get that okay. on this tape. And we, what's the time now? We'll get it set up. Okay. okay. Would you describe what you're holding, please? Well, this is a picture of our ship taken while we were in the South China Sea. The uh, photographic uh, department of one of the carriers was kind enough to do this. And it was pretty much standard practice in the Navy in those days to get your picture of your ship made while you were on a cruise. In fact, we also had a cruise book. I don't know where it is, but uh, photographs of the cruise and pictures of the guys and so on. But this is the ship, and uh, I had all the guys in the division, the supply division, signed it for me when I got off active duty. So these signatures are all around the side here. and There's one on here from my second class cook, uh, E5 cook, who said uh, he used to, I used to give him advice and then not follow it myself. <laughs> so he wrote on here, advice should be given as well, as, uh, should be followed as well as given. <laughs> he wrote that on here. But uh, here's the, the four holes, the two forward and two aft. And there's the uh, gun tubs I was talking about where the, uh, the old 5-inch 30s used to be. And these are real guns up here. We used to shoot those periodically. And every now and then we actually hit a box. We'd save up our cardboard boxes out of the, the supply department and they'd throw them over the side and then take shots at them. 
And we'd also use them for man overboard drills. Okay. So you throw a box over the side and yell, man overboard, and port side, and uh, you'd have somebody, you know, it would there'd be no warning. Yeah. And you'd try to bring the ship back around and pick up the okay. man. Um, this is, you drove the ship from up here and the, uh, off the bridge, and the supply department was back here in the first deck in the superstructure. So, and then we had various uh, stores, and below the first deck is where the mess decks were. And okay. Officers ate in the wardroom, which is right here. Okay, good. Okay. This is a map I made for my wife, I think, uh, right before we left the, um, the operating area. It says down here, USS Wrangell AE-12 World Cruise. 27 September 1965, 21 June 1966. And then the red dot lines, which you can't see, I'm sure, start here at Charleston, go down through the Panama Canal, over to Hawaii, then into the Philippines, operating over there, coming back down across the equator to Singapore, and then to Bombay, India, and back up through the uh, Red Sea here, through the Suez Canal, stopping in Beirut and Barcelona, and then steaming home back to Charleston. And so uh, it says uh, the red line shows the ports visited and then the green line shows the route home and I have home underlined about six times. <laughs> so we were really glad to get back. Okay. Would you describe these newspaper articles that you have framed? Well, we were the first um, East Coast ammunition ship to serve in the Western Pacific. So that was a big deal to the Navy League in Charleston. So they made sure that we got lots of publicity when we came home. And I think I mentioned they had a, a band for us on the pier. There's a picture um, in one of these of the band playing. There's the ship right there. Uh, here's a, a kid with a welcome home dad sign. There's a picture of our commanding officer, Captain Homer Duran. He, used, he was a submariner, the only submariner we ever had as a CO. Most of them were pilots. And uh, the headline here says, Rangel home from war zone. So uh, a lot of details in here. This is Daniel Santone, one of my storekeepers. He went to the Citadel and uh, through a mishmash in Navy Reserve records, wound up on active duty as an enlisted man instead of going to officer candidate school. And it was really sad because the Navy lost a good officer. But we had a great storekeeper. <laughs> he was terrific. He could do the job of any two people. Um, so we had we had a we had a good a good crew while we were gone. Well, that's good that you kept those newspaper articles too. Yeah, this I found these about two years ago. Didn't even know I had them. Well, you've got a fascinating story. I'd like to give you the opportunity to say anything else you would like to say, either for people who will be viewing this in the near future or down the road? Uh, just any message or any experience that you didn't mention before that you'd like to mention now? Just anything you'd like to say, feel free. Well, um, my wife and I have been blessed with four children and I couldn't convince any of them, three of whom are sons, to go in the military. Um, but I'm happy to say two of my grandsons have chosen the Marine Corps and they're, one of them is in Afghanistan right now. Wow. on his second tour. He had his 20th and his 21st birthday in Afghanistan. Uh, the other one uh, just came back from a cruise uh, because he was on, in an artillery unit, is in an artillery unit, and the uh, best way to get those guys anywhere is on a ship. So he's been, in fact I told him, I said uh, 45 years ago I was going north through the Suez Canal while you were coming south through it. And uh, that was kind of interesting. I would say to any young person finishing high school or college right now, particularly college, that probably the best experience that you could ever have would be to go into the military. Pick your branch. It almost doesn't matter. And if you want to make a career of it, that's even, even better. But just for the experience, because there's no place else where you'll get the kind of training, have the leadership opportunities, and be exposed to experiences that you can never get anywhere else. Um, I wouldn't trade my time for anything else. I, frankly, I wouldn't want to do it again. But that experience, uh, 
I'm sure has been a major factor in shaping my life. And after all, I would never even met my wife of 46 yeah. years if I hadn't have yeah. met her while I was at Supply Corps School in Athens, Georgia. Well, that's a wonderful message, and um, you should be very proud of your service to your country and your grandson's service to their country. Mm -hmm. And you, you played an important role in the Vietnam War and being on a ship that was supplying ammunition used to protect our troops. And so you, you were in a vital position and the leadership you showed and the courage you showed to by joining up and doing what you did is something that you should forever be proud of. And uh, we're honored that you came today to well, thank talk you very with much. us. And I feel uh, like I've led a charmed life in many ways to have had the experience to be associated with so many guys like you who served in country and went through unspeakable horrors. And uh, I was sleeping in a bed and eating three squares a day. Uh, we worked hard, but uh, compared to what a lot of folks went through at that time, it was nothing. You're welcome, and I'm glad to be a part of this. Well, thank you again very much.